We pick it up in verse 9 today. So, Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 9. Read along with me, if you would, please. As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love have no man than this, or no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask, the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Pray with me, would you please? Thank you, Lord, so much for this beautiful text. And I wanna do it justice. I don't wanna just blab and say stuff. I want this to be perfect time. And so I pray you overcome every obstacle in me that I would be faithful in the delivering of your word, your heart in all of this. But overcome all of us that our ears and our minds and our hearts and our spirits be receptive, readied to receive your word. That today here in this room we would get this deeper, more meaningfully, and more practically than we ever have. So we pray right now, Lord, that you would do your work, please. Have your way. We commit this time, I pray, Lord, you would, you would immerse me in your Holy Spirit, that you would be seen, that I would disappear. That you would come upon me by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would do through me what only you can do now. Speak a word or many into all of our lives, bespoke to our needs and situations, but also universally as we are human beings and your children. Have your way now, we pray, and we commit this time to you. Every minute of it, redeem them. Jesus, in your name, amen. Like always, please don't just believe me, don't just assume it's true because I say so. Search the scriptures. Let the Bible be your authority. Chapters 14 through 17 are an up-close and very intimate look at a time where John will uniquely record chapters 14 through 17 are almost exclusively exclusive to the Gospel of John. We wouldn't know they happened had John not written them down because they don't appear in the other three. The foot washing at Pesach, for instance, Passover. And it's there Jesus would say in the simplest sense, I've demonstrated this to you so you need to do the same. Now, he has taken on the role of the lowest servant. And he has demonstrated love in this, prideless service. Jesus has washed the feet of not only those that are clearly his disciples, but also Judas Iscariot, called his disciple, but never really part of the group, like he should have been. Then he'll hand the bread to Judas, and Judas will depart, and Jesus will say then, and this is in chapter 14, turn there for a moment, in chapter 14, verse 34. He has washed his disciples' feet, And he says this, in verse 34, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, but you also should love one another. By this, all will know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. Jesus had not just said this here as we see in chapter 15, but in chapter 14 in the upper room at Passover, Jesus is doing this. He had just washed his disciples' feet He's looked now at Judas Iscariot in the face as Judas is now on his way to gather a troop to arrest Jesus. And Jesus looks and says, now, notice it's past tense, I've loved you. And the way that I loved you, the way that I have loved past tense you is the way that I need you to love now. This is my commandment. They won't even know you're my students unless you do this. Then Jesus will say, I'm going away because I'm gonna prepare a place and then I'm gonna go back and get you but you'll never be left alone. I'm gonna leave you another helper. And by the way, you need to know I'm the way there, I'm the truth of it, and I'm the life you live now, Jesus speaking. And then in verse 23, look at it with me, in verse 23 of chapter 14, uh, he says, 
chapter 13, I'm sorry. Jesus says, uh, answers and he says, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. And my father will love him. We will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me doesn't keep my words. And the word which you hear isn't mine, but it's the Father who sent me. Look at verse 31 of the same chapter. Jesus says, but that the world may know that I love the Father as the Father gave me commandment. So I do arise, let us go from here. And Jesus shows us the second step of what it really looks like to love like he loved. The first, in the simplest sense again, is prideless service. But then in the second case, it's extreme obedience. The Father is telling Jesus to go to the cross. But understand, the only reason why Jesus is going to the cross is because it's the only way to redeem us. It's the only way to buy us out of our own guilt and sin. And Jesus knows that and therefore is going to ex exercise extreme obedience to the point of sacrifice and surrender. In chapter 14, Jesus now, well, let me say this. Chapter 14 ends with Jesus leaving the upper room. 14 ends with a right rise, let us go from here. So in other words, from that point on, Jesus is on his way en route to the garden that we know of at Gethsemane, which means the olive press. John makes clear Jesus had often gone there to pray, and therefore Judas knew the spot really well. In other words, Jesus is walking his way to the one place he knows Judas will have no problem finding him. He has done this, he's been preparing Judas to make it easy for him to arrest him, and he's preparing him and his disciples this whole time for his arrest. And as he's on his way, he begins to walk through vineyards, and as he does, he starts to speak to us about that. He is on his way from this point, and the place now of his abduction is awaiting him. He is going to, according to Luke, sweat like drops of blood in that garden as he prays if there be any other way. In chapter 15, he says, he's the true vine, and remaining him is the only way in which we're ever gonna bear fruit. And matter of fact, the term he uses is abide many, and means to remain. You gotta stick with me. As a matter of fact, in seven verses, the term will arise 11 times. And from there, Jesus moves us into this text. To give you an idea on the book and on the other side of it, in chapter 16, verse 27, look there for a moment. Chapter 16, verse 27, it says, the Father himself loves you because you've loved me and have believed that have come forth from God. Chapter 17, many of you are familiar, is Jesus' prayer uniquely recorded in the Gospel of John. And he ends the prayer, look at verse 26. The last thing Jesus says is not in my name, amen, but rather, and I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love in which you loved me may be in them and I in them. In other words, Jesus is on his way to his abduction, to his horribly violent and vicious arrest and beating and execution. And all he can think about is us. Now, he has again just spoken about the necessity of clinging to him to bear fruit. And he'll say, by this the Father is glorified in verse eight now of chapter 15, working our way to where we are. My Father's glorified if you bear much fruit, and so you'll really be my disciples. In verse nine, he starts this section with this, as the Father has loved me, notice past tense, so I've also loved you, notice past tense, abide in my love. And he moved from this issue of fruitfulness to keeping in love. And here is the danger, please hear me on this. You could be so busy trying to be fruitful, trying to be productive and put, put out some form of product that you forget this was supposed to be a product of love. And love shifts instead of grows. You get so caught up in the kids, you get so caught up in the project, you get so caught up in the thing that you forget this was actually because you were first in love. You were lovers committed in marriage and in that then this is what God always wanted to be first so he would call us back like the Ephesian church to our first love. Before children you woke up next to your wife, your husband, your spouse, somebody you stood at the altar and had a choice to say I do and you did. Then the kids come, then the thing comes, whatever that thing is and you wake up next to your partner now that's a coworker for the kids, or it's you wake up next to the thing that's your to-do list to accomplish the things that you think are gonna help make you more productive. But in the end of it all, the person you're supposed to be deeply in love with becomes more of a stranger. Now please understand, that can happen to any of us. And Jesus says, the Father modeled it and for me, and I'm modeling it for you, so that you need to follow in my footsteps. 
And I realize in this, the challenges that come with this, because Jesus is never telling us to love one another without demonstrating what that love looks like so that we can't just make it up and say we're doing okay. And there, hence, is our danger. And might I just say, as a pastor, as a person committed to serving, there is danger in this too. I call it the paradox of spiritual infidelity with the mistress of ministry. Because with each of us, we can actually leave our first love for something that we actually think is actually completely good, but God never called us to work for him. What God intended was for him to work through us. And if really we get to this point where what we're doing is we're trying to squirt out and pump out and fight out and we're sweating and we're working so hard and we're striving, but in all of our striving, we're at this place where we're exhausted and then we get angry at God. Why isn't this happening or whatever? And in the end of it all, Jesus is like, this isn't what I'm asking you to do is work for me. I'm asking you to be with me. And Jesus already in these chapters prior have demonstrated humble service, or if I'd say prideless service and extreme obedience. Those are two things, to be honest, I'd rather have it just be a warm fuzzy. And let me warn you, this word love that he describes here, that we, most of us, could pass the test if it were written. And I think looking at kind of Hugo and Deb's situation, and we're aware of it if you've ever had to get your license, there's two parts. There's the written exam, and then there's the practical part. And I just wonder if God did that in regards to our walks. How many of us could actually completely ace the written exam? but would never really get our Christian license because we actually have no practical. Because in the end of it all, we could say, well, selflessness, we know that that's the whole concept of love, and it's like, but I don't wanna love that person, I don't even like that person. Let me warn you, you probably will love, as God describes, somebody you like the least. Because you're actually not doing it for the things you'll get, but rather for the things you give. You'll do it out of a rather extreme obedience, whatever that extremity would be. And forgive me for being a little bit sedate as we go through this, but please understand, this is heavy. Because most of us will conceptually agree with everything that's gonna be said here, and yet what God really intends here is for us to be more than agreeing on the part that passes the written. He wants us getting our Christian licenses today, and for that to happen, he's demanding one thing. As the Father has demonstrated this to me, and has loved me, which Jesus would say that the Father has loved him since the beginning of time. And Jesus actually says, I wanna go in, in chapter 17 as he's praying, I really wanna take them back to be with me here so they would see the kind of love that you have for me here. They've just had to watch it from me. And he goes, I need you guys to stay. And notice the term in verse nine, it says abide in my love. Do you see that word in there? Do you know what that means? Am I still in love? I mean, it's a weird term, right? Because there's a difference between loving as a practical thing and then being in love. But he says, I need you to abide in this. You need to remain in love. How in the world do I remain in love with Jesus? Especially when I can't see him like I could have before. Especially when before I watched him heal people in front of me and I felt like at any given moment I could just turn to him and I could see his face and hear his voice and, you know, and, and I could touch him if I had to and I could smell his sweat. I could hear his footsteps when he walked by. And now Jesus is like, I'm gonna go prepare a place for you. You're not gonna see me like you used to see me. But you need to know, that doesn't mean I'm not gonna use you and it doesn't mean you're ever gonna be left alone. I left you my, I'm gonna give you my spirit so you will never be alone for a breath. Because I demonstrated in front of you because you're gonna, you need to know, I'm gonna start doing it through you, through my spirit. And he looks and he goes, look it, I need you to know you need to stay in love. But let me put it in a practical sense for us. We know the, tr the phrase, out of sight, out of mind. Some would say absence makes the heart grow fonder and others would say absence makes the heart wander. But what would happen if I was less in love with my wife when I didn't see her? It would really be a, an indictment on me, and it should be. Because what that means is there's a shallowness in what I claim to be committed to, or to the depth of my commitment. 
Jesus has never promised a long distance relationship. He's just promised one that you really couldn't see like you could before. It's like, just because you can't see me doesn't mean that you should wander. Because you're either going to stay or you're going to stray. But what would it be like for Jesus? You realize when Jesus walked the earth, he couldn't see the Father like he could before. Jesus lived 33 years that way, where he had to live a life where before, what would it be like to just have that complete and absolute perfect unity with the Father at every given moment, and it's like everything's infinite and before him, and now it's like moments of prayer that he gets away to have those moments of intimacy that used to be everything used to be every moment. Now there are these moments still walking in fellowship with the Father, but not that intimate they could have. And imagine Jesus on the cross saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Imagine saying, hearing him say that, knowing the intimacy that he had before that with the Father. But he goes, my, my Father hasn't left me here. And I realize in this, there'll be various reasons why I feel like I have adequate, well, I think adequate reason to stray. Now, I'm only saying this in regards to the Lord, but in all of those cases, if we're gonna be honest with ourselves, it usually winds up in three ways. Trials, temptations, and time. In trials, something happens, and what happens is it puts a strain on your relationship. Put it back to, I'm gonna just play this out with my poor wife, play it out with us. It's like if something happens where you just, something is sad, or it's weird, or it's even the tone, or whatever, or something just kind of grates on you, or tries on you for a moment. Uh, predominantly, of course, that's me to her, but just the same. And it's like a trial happens, and you start to go, well, what in the heck? Come on now. And you realize those moments, the pursuit of intimacy is much more of a commitment than it is an easy thing to do. Temptations. Now, temptations don't just have to come in the obvious sense, and there's the scary part. I mean, there are obviously things that you just go, well, that's clearly off limits under any circumstances. And you go, okay, well, that's not even a closed door. That's just a wall. But then there are other things you're like, well, on proportion, for instance, ministry. For instance, in, in there are so many other things you can do that are relatively decent things, but you can use them as your mistress. Like I would say again, the paradox of spiritual infidelity with the mistress of ministry. And I realize in this, Jesus is saying, you're in love, my love. Stay there. You'll either stay or stray. You're in love, stay there. Jesus saw the Father's love modeled and he copied it and showed us. And I hear Zephaniah say, oh, our God is in our midst, mighty to save, rejoicing over us with song, delighting in us, quieting us with his love and rejoicing over us in song. And I think, wow, Zephaniah got it, at least for the moment. Will I stay when I can't see him or feel him or hear him like I thought I used to? Well, how do I stay? Will I cling on to what he's already said? Notice verse 10. If you keep my commandment, you'll abide in my love. If you do what I say, you'll actually stay in love with me, just as I've kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. Now, wait a minute, what? Obey, obeying my, obeying God's word, obeying what he says is actually gonna keep me in love? How in the world does that work? Well, if love is a feeling which scripture does not define it as, well, then I'd think that would be really rough. But if I were to obey when I don't feel like it, what I'm showing him is that obeying shows that my commitment exceeds my feelings, that I'm committed beyond what I feel then I'm committed because I'm committed because it's right. Because let's face it, it doesn't matter who you are, you're not gonna feel all the time the same way. And if you do, chances are you're feeling nothing. 
Obedience with feeling to follow is actually a Middle Eastern concept. For some of you who are Mediterranean, you kind of know they say, you know, you'll commit first, love comes later. And I get the idea what they're saying is, is that if you kind of do it by feelings, you've got to know this, feelings are going to come and go. You can get feelings from an energy drink or a movie or a good song, but those things don't last very long. Even a Marvel movie only gets you a few hours, and it's sooner or later, it's just not going to last. I often say that feeling is a good ignition, but it is no steering wheel. It may get the car started, but the commitment's got to get you there. And somewhere in that we've been fed, well, as long as I feel it, like if the cards were honest, I love you because I feel like it right now, and I'll love you as long as I feel like it, which doesn't sell a good card, but it would be horribly honest. And it tells us, that the opposite is often what's done. I go try to rekindle feelings, and if I could try to rekindle the feelings, well then maybe it'll end up in commitment. Well, you realize that's the way the enemy works. If we could just get alone and get intimate, maybe then I'll get a commitment out of it. And what the Bible tells you is you need to commit first before intimacy. In other words, what the enemy's promising you is the products up front and then tries to make you pay for it later. But you know, nobody in the world is that dumb, or at least most people aren't. It isn't like, oh, you know what, go ahead and take that car and if you like it in, I don't know, a month or two, go ahead and start making payments. Yeah, if you find a guy that's like that, I guarantee you that car is stolen. So why in the world would we think we'd want to take for a test drive that which God calls greatest in his economy, and that's human beings? But I want you to know what's in the balance. This isn't just about loving. This is about staying in love. I mean, at that point where my commitment to God says, I don't have to see you like I saw you or hear you like I've heard you or feel you like I've felt you to stay committed because if I demand those things, then somehow I become the Lord of the relationship and that is unhealthy when I'm in a relationship with the living God. If you keep my commandments, you do what I say, we'll always be in love. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, so I don't have to worry about him changing his mind. I don't have to worry about him going, well, I ain't feeling it. He said, you'll abide in my love. Notice the term in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. Do you think it was, do you think Jesus always felt like doing what the Father told him? If you think Jesus always felt like doing what the Father told him, then let me ask you, why in the world was he praying what he did in the garden? He's like, Dad, I'm not, I'm not just not feeling this. I'm genuinely feeling the opposite of this. I don't want to go to the cross. And why didn't Jesus want to go to the cross? Because he was sane. No one in their right mind wants to go through that kind of torture. But in the end, he goes, if this is the only way to redeem your name here, well, let's do it. These things I've spoken to you that your joy may be, remain in you and that my joy, I'm sorry, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy would be full. Notice he goes, this is the difference, by the way. In this commitment of staying in love, following, and Jesus goes, now you've noticed what I've done. Again, it's been prideless service and extreme obedience. And he goes, this is what I'm demonstrating to you guys. And I'm asking you to not play games with this word, please, because the world sure is. Because I want the world to look at your church. I want the world to look at your life. I want the world to look at your relationships and go, man, that guy operates from an entirely different dictionary than I do on words like this. And these are simple words. Because clearly what they're doing in that place at church and what he's doing with his family and what she's doing with her friends and what the way they behave as Christians is so radically different, well then, then clearly their operating word of love is very different from mine. But I want you to recognize, here's the weird part in it. Notice he says again in verse 11, hey look at, I say this because I want my joy to remain in you. Not just the world's happiness, I want my joy to remain in you. And if you don't stay committed and you don't obey, don't expect my joy to be effervescent in your life. It's like, man, I feel miserable. I'm not obedient. 
and I feel miserable. God, make me feel better, and then I'll be obedient. God's like, you've got that one way wrong. I would love for you to follow me because I don't want to, you know, I, I, can't, I think it was Kirk Franklin who said, God does not want to bless, you're a mess. And the end of it all, disobedience is not something God's like, hey, you're really good at being disobedient. You know, at least you're like full on, here's a sticker for your rebellion. He's like, look it, if you're running from me, this is God speaking, if you're running from me, I want you miserable. I want you miserable because I don't want you without me. Why in the world would I want you happy and joyful and like Barney running around all over the place when in the end of it all, what you're doing is I created you to be with me and you're running from me. Of course I'm not gonna make you happy. People are like, why would God make hell so miserable? Because it's the one place he doesn't want to visit. And that's why he doesn't want you there. Why would God make it nice? He wants it to be the place you're like, "Mm, I don't want to go there. God goes, good. Because I don't either. So don't invent a new way of loving so you can feel better and say you're doing it when it starts with this. Are you committed or aren't you? Well, I can't feel them. Good, then let's see your commitment. Well, and you know that obedience is one thing when you can do it in front of someone because everybody loves a cheerleader. You know, it's kind of going, I love accountability when you're doing great because that's like going, you're doing so well. Way to get up and read and pray. When we need accountability is the last moment we actually want it. Because that's when it's like, dude, you need to get up and do something about this. And you're like, I know, but I've been ignoring that voice. Thanks for reminding me. And that's why we need it. And in this, he's like, look, it, I've spoken to you because what I really want is your life to be one that in the, I love the word that he uses here for full. It literally means above what you can contain. I want you to have more joy. Understand my plan for your life is to have such ridiculous joy in your life that you can't contain it all. So anytime someone bumps into you, you spill it on them. You've had nasty things spilled on in you before. Imagine like, oh, they're like, what was that? They're like, that was just joy. (laughs) Imagine if people bumped nice things on you, you're like, wow. I remember there was this one time where there was this guy, and this is very, very uncommon, in one of those like packed trains, right? Because usually when there are packed trains, there have been times recently for whatever reason, and I don't know, maybe it's when God gives you a nose my size, you can smell things really well. I've got the hardware, you know? Anyways, but it's like there are times where there was a guy that had like halitosis, bless him, but man, and he was, he was I couldn't touch him, he was far enough away, but the woman he went, oh, it just, everyone was just like, oh, right? And it's like, that happens more often. But one time this guy came in and he just smelled good. And I just like, I'm like, okay, this is gonna be a really weird question, but what in the world are you wearing? And he's like, I'm, I'm wearing this particular thing. And I'm like, all right, man. And he's like, you know, that happens to me a lot. And I'm like, all right, we've got a very weird relationship going, you know? And it's like, all right, well, hey, thanks. And then, of course, you're crammed in your place, right? You're crammed in the train and you're like, oh, thanks, thanks, man, that's all I need. And you're next to each other for like, and the guy, I, was like, I was like gonna take this thing for like 12 more stops and he was too. And they're like, all right, yeah, so, all right, can you share the Lord with the guy? That's probably what I should be doing at this moment, but it is really awkward. And I'm like, so, what do you do? And at that point, the guy's probably thinking I'm coming on to one. I'm like, hey, I'm a pastor. That didn't change him at all. He's like, well, I've met pastors. I'm like, well, anyways, get the, you didn't need to know. But the whole point was, what happens when you're so full of joy that people bump in you? You're like, what's that? They're like, well, that's just joy. How did you get that joy? You know, weird, I got it out of obedience. Wait a minute, you're obey, because let's face it, what the world thinks is if you're gonna obey Jesus, we're like the new like slaves in Egypt. And they're like, I just have to do it. I just have to do what God told me to. You know, and people are like, well, who wants to join that club, you know? It's like our worship songs are like, that's the sound of the man working on the chain gang, right? And it's like, wait, wait a minute, no, 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 that should not be it at all. We sing about freedom, but it's like service is actually something that like we see a joy in it. Let's face it, because if you've ever been without purpose, you know how lame that is. You're like, man, I just need purpose. And God's like, well, obey me. And he's like, well, I, I need something new. God's like, no, you don't. Just do what I've told you this far, and I'll give you more when you need it. Like, oh, that's that time thing. Remember how that challenges a relationship? Because that's the third of those. People say, oh, we just grew apart. And I'm like, no, you didn't. You stopped making plans together. Here's the worst part. What if the spouse spends all their time making plans, but then the other person's like, no, I really just don't have time for that. Because that's what the Lord is doing with us. He's constantly making plans with us. 
I'm like, ah, I don't really have plans. To, I don't have time to read. I don't have time to... Funny, you know, when you don't make time for those things, it's amazing how you will never have time for everything else. Have you noticed that? I had a friend who did this illustration once. We actually had this like clear jar. It was kind of a cool thing. He had this clear jar and he had these stack of walnuts and he had a bag of rice. And he's like, these walnuts are in essence those things we're to seek first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Those are the things that God calls us to. The rice, by the way, are the things that are gonna happen in every day, most of which you never planned and never made it to your diary before you got there. So, he poured the rice into the jar. You couldn't fit all the walnuts. Of course you couldn't. Because this is what most of our lives look like. They're a jar with a whole bunch of little things we're still trying to accomplish and we never say we have time for the others. He goes, but if you do the others first, the rice just seems to work its way around till the whole thing fits just nicely in the jar. And for some of us, maybe we're spending all of our time trying to count grains of rice. But we're not tending to the things that matter most. And then we wake up one day and it's like God's a total stranger to us because we've been too busy tending to the rice. Well, in this, Jesus is like, look at, I'm in love with you and that's never gonna change. Would you stay in love with me, please? Well, how do I do that? Well, practically, I just need you to do what I say. And you go, that makes no sense. From a world's perspective, you were right. Well, what is it that he tells me to do? Well, notice he doesn't even give us a chance to make that up. But I remind you, this is because I want you to have a, my joy in you and I want it to overflow. So here's my commandment. Could you just do this? Verse 12. Would you love one another as I've loved you? Notice again, as I have loved you. He goes, I need you to obey me. Well, how do you do, how do, what, do I, what do I do if I'm gonna obey you? He goes, well, here's the weird part. Put all of this together, it's simple math. If you're willing to love one another, you're obeying me. And if you're obeying me, I'm gonna give you a joy that is overwhelming, that is beyond what you can contain. And you'll stay in love with me. And you go, wow, that just seems like a strange thing. And notice he gets even to this point, he'll say, greater love have no one than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And you go, wow. So in the simplest sense, let me tell you what love really looks like. You give your life to give life. That's what it looks like. You put someone else before you. And according to this, by the way, it's his. We get so busy trying to love the world. And by the way, we are supposed to share Jesus with the world and care enough about them to not want them to go to hell. But we're supposed to love each other in a way that actually supersedes that first. There should be a love for God's people because they're already part of his family. You need to recognize scripture says we are not all born children of God. We're all born children of wrath. That's what Ephesians 2 says. But God is into adopting. Aren't you thankful? And God wants his family, and wouldn't this make sense? God wants his family to treat each other differently than other families. And he would want you to treat your brothers and sisters differently than you would have before you were actually brought into this family. So he says, look, this is the way it looks. And he says in verse 14, something that would sound extremely cheeky under other circumstances, right? You're my friends if you do what I command you. Now, I could hear my daughter saying that but I don't think it's with the same concept. No, you know, hey, if you do what I say, you'll be my friend. And you'd say, well, that's a bit cheeky. Well, wait a minute, don't, don't miss this. What has Jesus told us to do? You tell me, what has Jesus told us to do? He's only given us one commandment here. What is it? To love each other. How? Yeah, according to this, as he's loved us. As he's loved us, we love each other. So let me say, what's the one thing Jesus has, taught, has commanded us to do? As Jesus has loved us, we love each other. Does that make sense? So what's the one thing Jesus has called, commanded us to do here? As Jesus has loved us, we love each other. Now the rehearsal's over. Here's the test, the written part, the oral. What's the one thing Jesus has commanded us to do here? As Jesus has loved us, we love one another. Well, how has he demonstrated it up to this point? It was two things, let me remind you prideless service and extreme obedience. Wasn't that it? And he goes, look it, it's give life to give life. He goes, you wanna, now why in the world would he say, well you'll be my friends if you do what I command you. Well let me ask you something. If you wanna hate the members of his family, would you expect him to be friends with you? The one thing he's commanded you to do is as he's loved us, we should love one another. And if that's the case, he's like, look, if you don't do what I say, how would you expect us to be friends? 
If somebody has declared war on my wife and I became good friends with them, wouldn't you question that? If somebody wanted to kill my kids, now some of you know me, that would change my diary in a very big way. Would you expect me to befriend them? He's like, look it, if you're willing to love one another, I want to be friends with you. I want us to be close and intimate. I want us to be friends. I want us to be more than just master and servant. And let's face it, Jesus just could pull rank and say, this is what you need to do. Well, couldn't he? We don't even deserve that. I don't deserve that. I deserve hell. But instead, notice the fact, he's like, look it, I want to be friends with you, but I can't be friends with you if you're going to hate each other. You ever seen the hate the church church? I wonder what Jesus does with that. It's like, well, we're a church, but we actually don't call ourselves a church because we hate churches, and we hate people that call themselves churches, and Christians, we don't call ourselves a Christian. We're like new, vintage, old disciples, something. We don't, use, we don't want to use terms because we don't, you know, because labels are for clothing or whatever, right? You know, and you've seen those. And in the end of it all, he's like, hey, you know, how about we redeem the words? He's like, but what I'm looking for are people that aren't busy trying to go, we're not going to be like, because you know why we say that? Because we want the world to accept us. Isn't that what we're saying? Well, you know, I know that when I say religious, this is what you're thinking but how about this are you religious yes I am religious literally means devoted I want to be more devoted than anyone now granted the world looks at religion and says it's basically a cocktail of tradition and politics well neither of those are, are my faves but I would say this I want to be devoted to Jesus let's get the let's take the word back are you religious uh-huh but this is what the new religious looks like the new religious looks like the original religious which is devoted to Jesus you're welcome to inspect that But I want you to know, well, what about that guy? He's doing something crazy in that church. They're all running around and doing conga lines and screaming and doing laps. Hey, cool. Praise God there's a church for them. Because here they would they'd fall asleep quickly. But praise God there's a church for this because some of you would pass out at a place like that. And I'm not trying to pick on that. The bottom line is, is there's places for people where they belong. That's the good news. But they're not enemies. How in the world could they be enemies? I think God in his divine humor could say, well, I remind you, in my Father's house are many mansions and you don't get along with them, they're gonna be your neighbors. You know? And the whole point of it is, is that the Lord really wants us to go stop hating each other because by the way, hate is what he's gonna address next week and he'll say it at least eight times in the remaining parts of this, of this chapter alone. He's like, you, know, you need to know the world's gonna hate you so you really don't need anyone else jumping on that bandwagon and if the world's gonna hate your brother, they don't need you hating them too. He's like, but I want to call you friends, but if I'm gonna call you friends, you guys need to love each other. Now, how do we love each other? Well, according to what Jesus has demonstrated, prideless service is a good one, and extreme obedience to God is another. I go, what if we started with that? Now, listen to this line, verse 15. No longer do I call you servants. A servant doesn't know what his master's doing. Let's face it, when your boss tells you, he doesn't have to, he is not entitled to tell you why in the world he wants to accomplish what he's doing. He tells you something and you're just supposed to do it. He goes, but that's not the relationship I'm looking to have with you. I could have that, but I don't. That's not what I want. And the world looks and thinks that's what we have, by the way. He goes, but I've called you. Now look at this line for a moment, because this is going to be a rough one. I warn you, I've called you friends. You know why? Because all the things I heard from my father, I've told you, I've made known to you. So this is how Jesus defined what it meant to be a friend, is when the Father tells me something, I make sure you hear it. So wait a minute, I've got somebody that doesn't know Jesus, but I call them my friend. Has the Father told you what it means to be saved? Because Jesus says, let me tell you what a friend does. A real friend shares what the Father's told him. And I gotta tell you, I'm saying that for my sake because I don't want to call myself a friend to somebody that I could be indifferent about their eternity. He goes, look at I'm calling you a friend because I'm going to let you know everything the Father's told me I'm going to tell you. I'm holding nothing back on this. No, you didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that that fruit should remain. Oh, I love this word. Listen to this word, by the way. Enkomai. It's a simple word. Enkomai, by the way, or in this case, enkomai, <clears throat> means to choose for a special privilege or favor. 
Now, read verse 16. Read, take a look at it. Look, read verse 16 for a moment. <clears throat> he goes, you didn't pick me for a special privilege or favor. I picked you for a special privilege or favor. Did you get that so far? This is not salvation here in this point. This point is in regards to a mission. I've chosen you. I've chosen you for a special privilege. I've chosen you for a special favor. Y'all with me on that? Now the question is, what is the special privilege or favor according to this verse? Bear. To bear fruit. Did you, did you get that? Look at this, he's going, I've chosen you for a special privilege. You know what your privilege is? You get to bear fruit. I've chosen you for a special privilege, for a special favor. Chosen you specifically, by the way, because I want you to bear fruit, and that's gonna be an honor and a privilege and a favor that I'm gonna grant you. That's what I've chosen you for. I haven't chosen you to be alone, because remember the whole section right before this was, you need to stay attached to me if you're gonna bear fruit. But I didn't just choose you that you would bear fruit. What, what do we know about this verse in regards to fruit? It's going to remain. You know how hard that is? After 30 years of ministry, and you watch and you dump your life and your heart into people, and there are people that you watch, and they, their eyes sparkle, and they're like fireworks and colors, and they bloom and they blossom, and they're like, wow, the world's gonna be changed through that person. And then they go nuts, and they're like, what happened to that guy? What happened to that? Are you kidding? They, what? And we're talking, no, we're not talking about a stupid moment. Peter had a stupid moment, and God still used him in great ways. But they had more of a Judas thing where it's like, whoa, well, whatever happened? And you watch a few of those and you kind of go, and they're the easier thing to remember. Can you remember the last time you had an amazing meal? No, Tunde can because it seems like every time Tunde has a great meal, he walks you through it. It's kind of a fun thing. He's like, oh, oh, mm, mm, mm. And then he does this, mm, mm, mm. I'm in love. I get that. But can you remember the last time you had a nasty meal? We used to uh, launch restaurants, and one of the things we recognize is that the average person who has a bad encounter, and this was, by the way, before social media, would tell, openly just tell 45 people on average. But the average person who has a great encounter at a restaurant will tell two. Yeah, thank you very much. Now think about how many times somebody blogged, oh, I just had the best. Think about times you were like, that, that was just nasty. And the reason I say that is because God, called, when you get caught into something where you're just following the Lord, you, you're a cheerleader, regardless of whether your team seems to be winning or losing at that moment. But what you hate is when someone walks off the field and they're not even injured. They're like, forget it, I quit. And you're like, what? I'm cheering for you, man. What's wrong with you? And at those times, you start going, man, but where's the fruit? Then you read a letter like Hugo and Debs and you brought the tears. Because you remember when neither one of those knew Jesus. Please, please, please be more that. Because in the end of it all, God has chosen me for a special work too. As he's chosen you for a special privilege. Privilege. There's no part of this that isn't a privilege. You know what a privilege is? A privilege means you don't deserve it, but somebody had the authority and they were kind enough to grant it to you. That's a privilege. You know the opposite of a privilege is a right, where you just demand it. Ministry is not a right. Bearing fruit is not a right. Ministry is a privilege, and bearing fruit's a privilege. And he says, hey, I chose you for privilege, for honor. You bear fruit, and then that fruit would remain. That one day you will stand before me, and you'll see lives that, that you don't even, you're like, really, that life was touched? You'll be part of people's testimonies, and you'll be like, what, that guy? because you realize God's word never returns empty and we're almost done here, but please hear me in this. God chose you for that. He's like, you didn't choose me for that. It isn't like, oh Jesus, I have a special mission in ministry. I have a favor for, to grant you. I have a privilege to give you, Jesus. He's like, I chose you and I want you to change the world and I have a way that only looks like Abraham that Abraham's gonna do. And John can try to do it. But in the end of it all, John ain't gonna do it. God's got a specific privilege that he's granted to Dan. And some of you are really touched by that. 
and he's got a specific privilege and ministry that he has for Tunde. It'll be less of a beard, <laughs> but it'll be very ministered, it'll be specific for Tunde. And the reason I say that is, is that what happens when you forget that? You know the easiest way to forget that? Stop obeying, just stop doing what you're told. Because when you stop doing what you're told, you have, to conf you have to kind of comfort your conscience. You do it by going, oh, the boss is just nasty. Oh, it's just too rough, or whatever, the th whatever you want to do, and then I don't see the product of it. And then you just ease up. He's like, but you forgot this was a privilege, man. I, Paul said, God called me faithful, calling me into the ministry, but he saw it as a privilege. When the people, when, read the book of Acts and just read chapters two and, or three and four where you see the high priest and the, the leaders pull these guys over and sort of call up, crawl up into their grill and say, shut up about the name of Jesus. You can do anything but just shut up about the name of Jesus. And then it's like, well, we're gonna threaten them. And then they call them in and then they severely threaten them. I don't know the difference. It's like threatening, it's like, okay, but before it's like, we're gonna beat you. Now we're gonna really beat you. But whatever, they severely threaten them and then they beat them up. You know what happens? They leave and they say they praised God that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name's sake. Is there anyone in this room that feels like they could do that? Thank you, Lord, that I, you called me to varsity because in this, I graduated to a place where you found me worthy to actually let me get hammered for my faith in you. We'd be more like reading Psalms for comfort, blogging about how horrible that person was. I wonder if the disciples blogged what that would have looked like. I have a feeling it would look very different. You didn't choose me, I chose you. And I appointed you to bear fruit. You know how I want you to bear fruit? Because that fruit's gonna remain, but you know what you need to do? You need to love one another. Which by the way means, don't miss this, fruit is not just lost people getting saved. Fruit happens every time you actually minister to another Christian, but you invest as God called you to. You obey what he told you to do with them. That might be sitting with a meal and loving on them. That might be taking someone for a walk and praying. That might be opening up the word with them or hearing their heart or sitting and baking them a pie. I can tell you if God's told you to do it, it's gonna bear forth fruit. And if it's gonna bear forth fruit, it's gonna remain if he's the one who's bearing forth the fruit. And he goes, I remind you, what I get out of this is fruit that remains and a joy that's overflowing. I think this is a pretty awesome deal. And he goes, I'm just asking you to do this. Would you just follow me, trust me, and I want you to obey. Prideless service. You know the Bible says let another man's mouth praise you. In other words, you don't need to boast. Let someone else do it, so I'll do it for you a moment. And I'm just gonna pick on somebody, and I don't wanna say who, because I don't wanna embarrass Jaden. But that guy is always early to everything, and it's like you've never asked him to do anything, he just does it. And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that because I'm not comparing him to anyone. I just wanna say, I see the work of the Lord in that, and he probably doesn't even know how much that ministers to me because that is bearing fruit in my life because you see that and I'm like, I need to be more like that. Do you see what God's doing? You watch a gal, and I don't wanna say because I don't embarrass Lois, who by the way is always seeking out the guy that's, or the gal that's sitting by themselves and is always gonna be there and it's like, whether she does it intentionally or not, I have no idea, but I can tell you this, people are changed because of it, I am changed because it's bearing fruit in my life and in my wife's. She's like, did you notice this? So don't you think for a moment fruitfulness is just seeing a lost person saved, because if that's the case, you're like, well, I haven't seen anyone saved in a while. Well, continue to preach the gospel and trust the Lord, but God has fruit that he wants to bear right here. Does that make sense? Because remember, in all of this, has he told us to preach the gospel here? He's gonna tell us to preach the gospel. You're not off the hook, but this is all about each other. Have you noticed that? This is all about, I need you guys. Jesus said, like, look, at when I leave the room, I don't want you guys acting differently. Well, okay, yeah, but better. So when you don't see me like you think you could, or hear me like you think you did, or feel me like, you've, like you could claim to have, or whatever, or have, I want you still loving each other, and I want you still obeying, and again, I want it to be prideless service, and I want it to be extreme obedience, because I chose you for this. This is a privilege, and you should bear fruit, and that fruit should remain. So then, when you ever you ask the Father, he's gonna give you, because you know why? Because you're not asking stuff for you at this point, because you're loving each other. What you're asking is, give me the tools to love another person, and let's face it, those prayers are probably gonna be the most sincere. 
You're like, God, give me patience with that person or give me whatever, or give me insight because this person, or give me the strength because this person's in need or God, just give me joy that you promised to give me and give me the strength to obey you in this because I wanna say that I have loved you by doing what you told me to because that's obedience and I wanna do that by loving those people that you know are part of your family, that I know are part of your family and I wanna see them do that. Could you imagine what would happen to us? People would go, what the heck is happening at your church? They'd probably call us a cult. They'd still want to join, though. She goes, by the way, in case you forgot, and he ends with this, these things I command you. Notice it's plural, these things. These things I command you, that you love one another. Love one another, women. Sit in that room for a moment. Judas is gone. Now you got trust issues, wouldn't you? Jesus has left the room, we're walking to where Jesus is gonna actually be abducted, where he's gonna be arrested and beat. We're all gonna flee on him, and he's already told us, every one of you is gonna leave me tonight. So every person I look at is a traitor. Or I look inside and I see there's a traitor there too. But at that moment, I would still look and go, oh yeah, clearly, Peter, I would expect that. Peter, Jesus even said, okay, three times, you're gonna do it, buddy. So, oh, <laughs> what a jerk. Jerk, jerk, jerk. And he goes, I need you to love him. That guy? Oh, come on, really? That guy? John, wait a minute, John, the guy that wanted to call fire down with his brother, the sons of thunder, the ones who, by the way, have already brought mom into the picture and said, hey, Jesus, by the way, I need you to do me a favor. I'm an old woman, you need to do me a favor. Let my sons be your right and left-hand men. And the rest of the guys are angry, and I wonder if how many of them are like, ah, I wish I'd have thought of that. You know, and it's like, oh, come on, right? And you're like, you, you know, come on, love those guys. The sons of thunder? Love those guys? Do you know how abrasive those guys are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I told you you have to because it isn't going to come easy because if it was easy, you wouldn't have to make a conscious choice to do it. Well, that guy's mercurial. On one moment, he's super easy to get along with and the next moment, he's Peter. Hey, you think it's rough. Do you realize that Peter wrote 1 Peter? That's probably a no-brainer for you guys, right? And Peter wrote 2 Peter? And do you realize in those letters, it actually says, wives, be submissive to your own husband? How would you like to be Peter's wife? And have Peter go, honey, I just wrote the part of the Bible. Read this part. Who wants that? And they're like, oh, he's going to be impossible to live with now. And do you realize when you read the people that Jesus chose as his disciples, you're like, this is the motliest group of people. And then he goes, and then he tells them to do, they're arguing over who's greatest while Jesus is about to get beat to death. And Jesus looks and goes, you guys need to love each other. That group of people needs to love each other. And you're like, that person's so different from me. And he goes, yeah, love them. How do you love them? Simple, I want you to be, give them prideless service and I want extreme obedience from you. Because I'll tell you, call that person. No, don't call that person. God, can I text them? That's kind of obedient. A phone call's an hour and a half. A text, I could pretend like my phone died. Call them. I'm not asking for obedience, I'm asking for extreme obedience. Total obedience. Not kind of obedience. When there's that part that's the gross thing and you realize there's one person that's gonna pick up the towel or grab the thing or stay up late, who's that person? Because that's the person who's loving. And I'll tell you, I stink at loving like this. I stink at it. But he goes, hey, I remind you all the way back from the beginning of this when Jesus was washing his disciples' feet in 13 and walking with us from that point on, I realize he's been saying, look it, I've shown it to you, you need to love like this. I've shown it to you, you need to love like this. He goes, I'm, stop focusing on everything else for a moment and get that first. Because if you get that first, the world's gonna see what my family, that my family's better. That my family's better off, my family's who they should be. And they're gonna to wanna to be a part of it. And remember, this whole part of it, then let, then let the Lord bring them in. So as we go to prayer, let, just let me ask you, are you willing to pray that kind of crazy prayer? God, make me a real lover like this. That is one that is prideless in his service or her service, that will obey totally, not just kinda, and think I've done it. And what if it happened here? 
All right, Lord, I'm available. Use me. Because it is a privilege to serve you. It is. And the fruit, that's his job. My job is to stay attached. How do I stay attached? Stay obedient. Keep his word. And as I keep his word, he's gonna bear forth fruit that would remain. There's the beauty in it. Now, as we go to prayer, I wanna take a moment in quiet, and then we're gonna pray. Because I really know that we can inherently agree with these things, but I'm gonna pray that God nag us in the kindest of ways to remind us what was said that's true when we don't wanna obey, or when we kinda wanna obey, or we wanna obey kinda, or we wanna serve but only when it gives us the glory. Pray with me, would you please? God in heaven, I wanna thank you for the demonstration of your love through your son, Jesus Christ. You showed me through Jesus Christ's sacrifice that there was no sacrifice too great to redeem us. That you didn't say, okay, up to this point. You told us it was like a man who walked through a field and saw a jewel so precious that he was willing to give up everything else he had just to get that jewel and you show us that we're that jewel. And though you had everything but us, Jesus, you clothed yourself in flesh, walked away from that glory and the intimacy of that face-to-face time with your father so you could be here and get the flu and and feel yucky and pull all-nighters and feel the fatigue from it and put up with Peter and John and James and Judas and the religious leaders who were constantly looking to find you doing something wrong, running around with their doctrinal combs to find one knit. And yet God in that Jesus, you never once failed. You never failed. And here we are, Lord, agreeing inherently with these things because you demonstrated it. But Jesus, it wasn't just that you didn't open fire on the religious leaders. You didn't go off on Peter like you could have. Oh, thank you that that we're not you because you're not us because we would have. God, you were obedient even to death on the cross. That extreme obedience. Where no part of our, of our intellectual fiber, no part of our emotional base would agree. This is, this is great, this is a good thing. Except for the part in our spirit that says, not our will, but yours be done. Because in it, you would receive us, you'd get the jewel. And Lord, we confess to you that we can say that we love the world, but James told us to love the world as adultery with you because we're not supposed to be befriending them that in the sense of just trying to be their buddies, but to be the friend you tell us here where we share what you've shown us. And we confess to you that we can feel much more obedient than we are simply by doing the easy things and then looking for stickers for it. But Jesus, you've challenged us to a greater standard, a higher moral compass than the world. You've told us that even the lost Gentiles would love those who love them back, would lend to those that they would receive back from would be kind to those that they would expect kindness in return. And you told us that we are to do beyond that, to love the unlovable. And Jesus, you demonstrated that by loving me. To be kind to those who spitefully use us, 
to pray for those who persecute us. There's nobody in the world that would do that except you and those who claim to be like you. And we confess to you, there's no part of us that wants to do that, especially within the body where there are Peters and Jameses and Johns, where there are doubters like Thomas. And we just want to tell you, Lord, we need your rescue on this. Your church is not known for love. And granted, I know that the world would want to not see. But Lord, when we are doing what you call us to, it's your job to highlight and spotlight as you see fit when the time is needed, when it's right. Forgive us, Lord, for we've been busy looking more at the outcome than the obedience. It's your job and you've chosen us, Lord, to bear fruit and that that fruit would remain. Oh God, today, for each of us, reignite that in our hearts. Even if we can't see the fruit, or we can see but in a small way or whatever, trust us, oh, sorry, help us to trust you so that we could be obedient prideless service and total extreme obedience. God, that we would do that. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross where the only reason to do that was out of obedience to the Father to obtain us. Father, thank you for raising him from the dead so that we could have a new life. One now, Lord, that doesn't have to look like the life we had before that was selfish, self-centered, and self-serving but now one way we can love. And you told us that now that we've been set free, not to use that freedom as a vice, as an opportunity for vice, but rather through love serve one another. Make us such people now, we pray. Jesus, we need you to be our Lord and we need you to be our power to do this. And I pray that as we commit beyond our feelings, May your joy overcome us and overflow from us. So here we are, we're yours. And we thank you for the privilege of being in your word and trusting you with the results now. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen.